Uh, the first uh, of the losers apparently is, you know, uh, Prime Minister May, because uh, she aimed at an objective, which was really a what we call a shoo-in or a, a massive victory to give her a solid basis for negotiations in Brexit. And instead of a solid uh, shoe in, she got a shoe at another place. Uh, and as a matter of fact, uh, came out very sad and uh, understandably a uh, very uh, short change. She got much less than what she had hoped for. Not only did she get much less, but she's even in the position of having to look for a, another uh, party in order to form a coalition uh, which means that she would have to give something for that. And the only other party ready to do this is the Northern Ireland uh, group, uh, which uh, the unionists, uh, who are usually uh, very demanding in terms of what they would like, uh, and it's not going to be easy. So this is rather humiliating. So I say the first loser, obviously, is the prime minister. It was clearly a mistake. She didn't have to call for elections. Uh, no one uh, told her to, but she felt that it would have given her a stronger position. And when she called for elections, the uh, the odds were, you know, very high in her favor because she had a very big lead of some 20 points uh, margin in terms of public opinion polls. So uh, it was reasonable. She had a reasonable expectation. But she did such a bad job of it that, unfortunately for her, she ended up a, a loser. So that's one loser. Uh, obviously, he hasn't completely lost. He is still staying in there in spite of opposition, uh, both in the Conservative Party and outside, who are telling her one after another that it's time to go. Uh, but she seems uh, intent on, on staying in if she can and uh, as long as she gets enough support, uh, you know, she'll stay in, primarily because there's no one else there who could really uh, replace her easily, and uh, this is a big problem. Uh, okay, so that's one loser. A, an obvious winner is, uh, of course, the leader of the uh, Labour Party, who no one expected would do a, a good job. Uh, no one even in his own party, uh, because uh, they were all very critical of him. And Corbyn instead uh, did an excellent job and uh, was able to arouse uh, the sympathies of many uh, and even uh, among young people. And he is certainly not young himself. So that's also, you know, a considerable uh, gain, not enough to completely overpower uh, the uh, the conservatives, but still, uh, he did uh, quite well for himself, and that is going to uh, keep him in the job, so to speak. Uh, and so, in this sense, certainly, he is a winner. Uh, he has become a, a major uh, character, whereas previously he was treated as you know uh, a passing phenomenon that uh, would make too much difference. So, in this sense, he's a winner. Other losers, obviously, the Scottish Nationalists uh, came out uh, very poorly in the election. Uh, they lost uh, quite a few seats, and even though their leader claims it was a victory because they got more <laughs> more votes in, uh, in Scotland than the other parties all put together, uh, but the more votes happened to be much less, <laughs> much fewer than that she had had in the last uh, election. So it depends on how you look at it. Politicians have a, a way of defining victory uh, <laughs> as whatever it may have happened, no matter how bad it may be. I remember who was uh, very good at that used to be Bettino Craxi, uh, <laughs> who used to claim he was going to get 15, 16 percent, ended up with 11 and said it was a victory. So it depends on how you define your objectives. And obviously, the definition can change after the fact as well. So, uh, again, it's not that easy. Clearly, uh, the Liberal Democrats uh, came out a little bit better than they had feared. Uh, the Liberal Democrats uh, took a big risk because they actually called for a new referendum uh, and they wanted to uh, undo the damage of the Brexit. 
which uh, is very reasonable in my eyes. Uh, but in the, unfortunately, in the eyes of most of the British who voted in favor of the Brexit, uh, it was not really acceptable that, you know, they should challenge uh, their own uh, ways. Uh, interesting enough, during the campaign, uh, there's practically no reference to the Brexit. Uh, they avoided the, the issue uh, either because they feared that people had had too much of it, uh, or they feared the divisive effect of bringing up Brexit because the division is still there. Great Britain is divided uh, very strongly on the, the Brexit issue even today, but uh, the effect has been that most people just don't want to talk about it and don't want to think about it uh, for obvious reasons because uh, it's not a very happy thought. But uh, in any case, the, uh, the fact is that uh, even though they avoided the Brexit issue in the discussions and the debates, uh, it was always behind the scenes. And as a matter of fact, uh, if you look at the, the voting uh, yesterday, uh, generally speaking, the remainers, those people who wanted to stay in the European Union, uh, were basically the, the main force behind uh, and supporting labor. And the Brexiters, the people who wanted to uh, to leave, uh, were the main force supporting the Conservatives. There were obviously some shifts here and there, so uh, it was uh, a rather uh, a strange mixture. But on the whole, the, the people who hoped to remain supported uh, Corbyn because he represented what they call a, a soft Brexit. That is to say, uh, all right, all right, we're leaving. We have this stupid referendum. We have the result. We may not like it, uh, but let's make it as soft as possible, meaning let's change as little as possible. Let's keep whatever we can from the, uh, let us say, the advantages that came out of uh, being a member of the European Union you know, while leaving uh, and uh, hoping no one notices that we have left. Uh, the other hand, the... Uh, People around the uh, the UKIP uh, party, uh, you when we speak about losers, obviously the UKIP as a party uh, was a big loser, and uh, it practically disappeared. <laughs> it's a party that has vanished in thin air. But the interesting thing is that even though they disappeared, uh, they went into different places. Uh, and even though most people imagined that they would go to the conservatives, and many of them did, there were quite large groups that apparently went to labor, uh, which is still strange. I would guess that probably the thinking was that, well, they've achieved their objective, which was the Brexit. And it was, you know, basically a party that had a single issue, a, a one issue party, uh, that issue is resolved, or it seems to be resolved. Obviously, uh, you know, why bother staying around? Uh, and so they left in droves. Uh, and the, the effect was, of course, that, uh, well, they got their Brexit, but how that is going to be formed and what that's going to mean ultimately still remains to be seen. And the, uh, the losers there are, uh, yes, winners and losers at the same time, because, you know, the uh, there seems to be a willingness to accept the will of the people in the first referendum uh, and not to try to change it among uh, most of the electorate and most of the parties. And in that sense, they're winners. Uh, but on the other hand, what that means, uh, Farage, I saw interviewed yesterday on uh, the BBC, and uh, he uh, was very upset and he said, uh, this might, you know, undermine the Brexit itself because it's not going to be the Brexit that he wanted, which was a clear break on every uh, item in every front uh, to leave the uh, customs union, to leave, you know, practically all areas of cooperation and create a, a, a great mythological independent uh, Great Britain. Uh, it's a type of atavistic view looking back to a past of, of grandeur when Great Britain was an imperial power and trying to uh, restore it. But uh, I'm afraid, you know, there wasn't much hope of that anyway. It's going to be a rather sad tale in any case. And the question is simply how you can limit the damage rather than uh, what great things you're going to do. But he said that 
he is so disturbed that he is going to re-enter active politics because he's so-called active because he's a member of the European Parliament, uh, which the European Parliament isn't too happy about. Uh, but in any case, uh, he, he is there, but he wants to get back into British politics. And so uh, he thinks that he's a loser, uh, even though, as I said, generally there is a consensus, apparent consensus, not to uh, to try to overthrow uh, the referendum, at least not yet. It may turn out that, you know, the, the negotiations uh, will be very difficult. And, uh, and that's where uh, everyone is worried because uh, in that sense, everyone's a loser in Great Britain because uh, their bargaining position with a weak government, a government that demonstra- demonstrably has a divided public opinion uh, is not going to be a good, easy negotiator. As a matter of fact, apparently, uh, even the uh, members of the commission uh, have indicated that they would prefer a strong government in Great Britain because at least they would have a policy and you know what they want. And you can know the way it is today, uh, you have confusion. No one really knows uh, what they want. And uh, the fact is that if they themselves don't know, how are the others going to know? And how do you negotiate around that? So now there's even discussion of the possibility of putting in a delay, uh, which is uh, difficult because they're supposed to start negotiations uh, immediately and (laughs) only have a few days. Uh, But uh, many people feel that uh, starting negotiations now with a new government coming in and the uh, difficulties that are going to arise in trying to form a majority in parliament uh, with a hung parliament, as they call them, uh, in England, are going to be very, very hard to overcome. And the the fact is that that may take time. Uh, But the the regulation of of Brexit is, is written into the treaties and they don't have time. They have deadlines. And they're supposed to be out by, you know, another year and a half. And so it's uh, it's going to be a rather difficult situation. So, again, getting back to the question of who won and who's lost, I think that in any case, uh, the British as a whole have lost. But I think that even if they had uh, given a strong mandate to uh, to May, uh, she wouldn't have been able to do very much anyway. Because whoever is going to go and negotiate is going to find it very difficult. You have, you know, 27 other states. Negotiation in any case is difficult by definition because everyone has something that he or she wants, that his uh, government wants. And uh, it's not easy to find compromises. Uh, And when uh, you have a, a split population and popular vote at home, uh, it's obvious that everyone knows that. And so, you know, they can take advantage of that in the negotiation and it creates a rather weak position. And from a weak position, you don't usually come out with very much. So uh, in this sense, yes, all the British have lost, but they already lost with Brexit. If you remember, I already said I didn't think that was a very good idea in the beginning. But uh, I think that more and more People are realizing that. And that may have also been, you know, some people ask, well, yeah, why did these people from UKIP uh, go and join the uh, the labor group, the labor votes? And uh, I think you have a combination. One, I already mentioned that they had already achieved their objective. But another one, I think that there are many people who were disillusioned, who felt, well, it was a mistake and are trying to remedy that. And that may be a sense of, trying to remedy the mistake by reducing the negative effects. And this is what Corbyn effectively represented. That is to say, uh, it's a bad deal, but I'll try to make the best of it. Uh, whereas, of course, uh, May was giving the, May herself, you know, was really very strange because she originally was a part of the Remainer group. That is, that they should remain in the UE. But, you know, she's changed in order to be able to follow the will of the people, Vox Populi, uh, wherever that leads. But in any case, uh, I think that covers most of the winners and losers. There are still others, obviously, uh, 
around there, the um, the smaller groups, not just the UKIP, but also uh, some of the other small parties also haven't done too well. The tendency was to strengthen the bigger parties, Labour and uh, and uh, the Conservatives. The Tories uh, did relatively well. They managed to hold off, uh, but uh, didn't in any case, you know, have the success that May was hoping for and thought that she could count on. Uh, not just May alone, many of her uh, supporters and people in the Conservative Party. She now has a, a bunch of uh, enemies in the Conservative Party who would like nothing better than to get rid of her. The terrorist attacks at uh, London Bridge and uh, others obviously have had their effect too. Uh, usually when we have uh, terrorism, you have a tendency to move toward a stronger government. You know, your tough hand, more police power, uh, in this case, it hasn't really uh, turned out that way. Uh, I think that uh, many people uh, felt that uh, Corbyn's criticism, and not just his, of, uh, of May was uh, effective and valid. You know, she had cut back uh, these funding for uh, police, reduced police forces, etc. And when she was, and she was for a long time, six years, uh, the uh, internal minister, or minister of internal affairs for uh, Great Britain uh, and had control of the security issues. And so uh, she suffered for that, obviously, as well, uh, rightfully. I mean, you know, she has to accept the responsibility for that. Uh, not that these, these types of uh, uh, attacks are, are very hard to either uh, predict or, or prevent because we're not talking about big groups of people uh, armed to the teeth with explosives and everything. Anyone can pick up a, a van and go crashing into uh, people wherever you find them. And unfortunately, uh, there are enough individuals around who uh, think that's a way of gaining access to paradise. So uh, that's not a, an easy job. And even if you had more police, I'm not sure how effective that would be. Well, obviously better, more than fewer, but still uh, no guarantees, so to speak. It's a, a rough world we're living in. And unfortunately, uh, we can see that. By the way, I was uh, very impressed uh, when I was watching the results uh, on the elections last night that uh, so many of the elected parliamentarians are themselves immigrants or children of immigrants. The names were Pakistani, Indian names, Arab names, and uh, you know, I was like, I, and, and many women. I think this is the highest number of women in the uh, elected to parliament. So uh, Great Britain is changing very obviously, and uh, that I think may also have some effects. I think uh, I'm not one that worries so much about the effects on the, uh, let us say, the cultural unity of society, because obviously uh, you can hardly speak of that in Great Britain anymore, and I don't think it makes any sense anyway, but uh, nonetheless, uh, these th changes are going on. Not all of these people are going, are becoming, uh, uh, you know, followers of the, the caliphate uh, and ISIS, uh, and many of them are becoming active uh, politically, uh, many Muslims, uh, and I think uh, this is generally a, a good sign. Now, also in the Conservative Party, which surprised me even more. Normally, it would be possible. And in spite of all the problems, it is still possible. But possible does not mean probable, <laughs> because there are so many reasons why that won't happen that it's uh, hard to imagine, but it is possible. Uh, what are the reasons? Uh, one, the uh, Labour Party has no interest whatsoever in aligning itself with the, uh, with the Conservatives. Uh, it would go against uh, the party itself. And don't forget that one of the uh, things nice about uh, Corbyn is that he's gone back to a more let us say, left of center 
uh, approach to uh, politics and economics uh, than what the uh, Labour Party has been offering in the last 20 years. Uh, and his success is one of the reasons why people are so surprised, because people have come to believe that the only thing that gains anything is pure capitalism and nothing else. Uh, and he's demonstrating that that isn't the case. Social responsibility, social ideas are still important, and maybe even more important, especially for the younger generation, because they are associated with ethical values, etc. And so, uh, again, uh, for these reasons, it would be very difficult to imagine a grand coalition like the SPD and CDU uh, in Germany, uh, practically unimaginable. And even more so now, maybe Blair or someone before that might have been able to do that, but uh, certainly not Corbyn. Uh, there might be a change in the leadership, obviously. It's possible because there are still many so-called moderates in the Labour Party who are more right of center than left of center. But uh, So that's one reason. The other parties, uh, each party has its own problems. The, uh, the Liberal Democrats, the Liberals did try a coalition with the Conservatives, and they lost tremendously uh, because the Conservatives have different ideas and the Liberals are very strong on uh, certain economic concepts and liberalism in its traditional sense, but also liberalism in its political sense. So it's a, it would be very hard for them to do that because of their experience, their bad experience in the past. They ended up losing more supporters than they, they gained. Uh, yes, the, uh, the Northern Ir Irish uh, can uh, do that pretty easily. And because they are in a very uh, strong uh, position with very few <laughs> members of parliament, uh, they can probably blackmail uh, as much as possible and get as much as possible out of it. But that's not a grand coalition, that's a little coalition. The other groups, uh, well, uh, it's hard to to, uh, to think of. The UKIP has practically vanished. Uh, maybe they'll come back from the, the realm of the vanished and reappear, who knows? Farage will do his best to <laughs> try that, but I don't know if he'll be successful. Uh, otherwise, uh, I don't think it's, it's, as I said, it's conceivable. The ideological differences are not necessarily that strong, but the political differences are fundamental. And each party that went into that would take tremendous risk, which uh, none of them want to take. So I doubt it. I don't think you see it. Uh, that's also not an easy question, because uh, what's good for the European Union? Sure, about to enter into negotiations, difficult negotiations. I don't think uh, people realize on the whole what this long period of integration has meant in terms of all the bonds. There's something like 19,000 uh, legal uh, measures that you know are shared and Great Britain has taken from the whole. Just the, the legal system of the European Union, European law, uh, is extremely complex, and trying to get out of that is extremely difficult. Uh, so, uh, what can I say? I don't think that uh, you know we, we have a, a real possibility for uh, a, a change that would be positive for Europe coming out of a weak government. Uh, the weak government uh, is going to have difficulty in trying to find an agreement with the European Union, because whatever is offered by the European Union, uh, the negotiators, whether it be May or anyone else, who they have a negotiator already selected, uh, is going to have to come back and negotiate internally with all of the groups that they're dependent upon for support. And so it's going to be even more difficult to find you know, any solutions which could be a compromise solution. Uh, if they try to take a, a, a tough stand the way they would have liked to, uh, they're going to find that you know, the European Union is going to be even tougher because uh, they have the support. Uh, no one, I think, among the 27 remaining member states wants to punish 
uh, the British, but no one wants to give them anything for nothing either. Uh, they'll bring out all of what Great Britain owes, what they have gained from the uh, European Union, uh, Union, what they owe in terms of all of the benefits that they have received and continue to receive, and they're going to get a big bill. And they're going to be asked to pay that bill, which is going to be, you know, a, a very impressive uh, bill. And they'll probably try to avoid it, but that's going to be very difficult. Also, someone is going to notice that, you know, the uh, integration on a, an economic basis, especially trading, uh, has benefited the British and benefited the European Union, too, to be sure. But that's 27 of them and, you know, one <laughs> Great Britain. Uh, and even if they're a big trader, an important trader, uh, and even if they have strong friends at this point uh, overseas uh, in, uh, in Trump, uh, that's not going to make much difference. I think they've given up on Trump anyway, but in any case, if they haven't yet, they ought to. But uh, this is uh, something which is going to, I don't think a, a weak Britain is in the interest of, uh, of Europe. I think a strong Britain a solid Britain, uh, which is not a source of uh, problems, and a Britain ready to cooperate uh, is probably the best that we can hope for. Uh, and whether May can do that, given the stance she's taken in the past, is not clear. But certain she's, she's going to be under pressure from Labour and all of their supporters, uh, and it's not going to be that easy to avoid that. So uh, we'll, we'll see what happens. But I. I suspect that a, a stronger British government would be in the interests of Europe as long as it meant, you know, a stronger government that was ready to cooperate and ready to compromise and to find solutions and not a stronger government that is really weak because it has to demonstrate how strong it is. Uh, this is, this is one of the political problems that uh, we're going to see in the next few days, actually. Because they're under pressure to move past.